Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm James, and with me is Richard, who's Hello. been looking at hard-working vehicles and on-the-job safety. And welcome, for the first time, to Ace Cars Guider, Georgia, who's smoked out a story on cannabis and cars. And we'll update you on the latest musings from the SpaceX cowboy in this week's Musk Watch. So stay with us. But first, we have had some feedback, which is lovely. Um, regular listeners and viewers might uh, recall that last week we had Brian Tanty, coach builder extraordinaire, come in and share some of his experiences and some of his views about um, what the things that he does. And Brian Streetberger, um, so another Brian, said last week's guest was coach building guru Brian Tanty. Brian said, so good to hear from industry experts and inspirational people like Brian, passing on his knowledge and experience to the next generation Thank you so much. Wow. So it's a wow. thanks, Brian, from Brian. It's a Brian. It's the two Brian's. The life of Brian. <laughs> yeah. Commenting on Brian. Thank you so yeah. much for that feedback. Um, it's great that you enjoyed it, and it was interesting, mm. wasn't it? I certainly found it an interesting chat. But straight into it, Richard. Yes. Fill us in on what's been occupying your mind in recent days. Big, big news uh, in the auto industry this week, uh, particularly the Australian auto industry. Uh, Ford has announced that autonomous emergency braking will be standard across the entire Ranger and Raptor range. Yeah. That's huge news because until now, um, there are only two other utes out there in Australia which actually had AEB. Uh, that's the uh, Mercedes-Benz X-Class. Yep. And the Sangyong Musso, um, sort of two ends of the, the same spectrum. Yeah, right. Um, the Mitsubishi Triton does as well, but it's not across the entire range. It's from the GLX grade up. Uh, that AEB is standard. And this is huge, huge news because these vehicles are often being used now as family cars. Um, it's just it's just kind of outrageous that it's taken until now uh, for, for, for this to happen. Um, we're still waiting on, you know, the majority of, you know, the ute world out there to get on the on, on, onto the AEB wagon as well. Um, but um, the United Nations has drafted a, a piece of legislation on utes? On utes. Well, on all cars. <laughs> okay. Uh, United Nations wants... United Nations has drawn up a, a 40-country uh, signed agreement. Uh, it's just a draft. Yep. That by 2020, AEB should be mandatory... Everywhere. ...across the globe. Gotcha. Yeah. Because it's an interesting issue, isn't it? You know, I suppose in the ute segment, it's very price sensitive. Yep. So AEB costs, presumably, to put it in there. But... Why should someone's life be exactly. less important purely because they're traveling in a commercial vehicle? Well, it seems well, um, wrong. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, on a work site, you've got really stringent OHS rules, you know, <laughs> from your high vis vest to your helmets and stuff like that. But then, probably the most dangerous part of your journey is then when you get in the ute. You yeah, drive. Going to and from work. Going exactly. to and from work. Exactly. So what's the point of being super safe at work if, you know, something happens on the way home? So, and, you know, as Ford has shown, and it's, you know, it's great to see leadership like this uh, from, you know, from Ford, and hopefully the rest will follow, um, that it, it can be done. You know, there have been theories in the past as to why, you know, is it too expensive? Is it too hard with bull bars and whatnot? Yep. But, like, when was the last time, you know, you saw a bull bar on a you, you, you You do occasionally, but not... Not, not many these days. Uh, yeah, it's true, isn't it? And also, it's such a, a furious arm wrestle mm. at the top of that market mm. between the Toyota Hilux and the Ford Ranger yep. that a, a move like this can have an enormous uh, benefit Absolutely. for the people that buy the Rangers and for Ford because um, they've got a distinct advantage in the market now. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if I was out there looking for you, this would be possibly a deal breaker for me. Yeah, you know yeah, what I definitely. Mean? I would go down, you know, the safest possible route because, you know, you use the car as your, your work vehicle, um, but also as a family vehicle. And what about the, the dollars? Does it is it gonna cost more only, or is it just only being... a slight of course there's been a price increase, but there always is with model yep. updates. Um, yep. but just just a tiny increase, you know, from about three hundred and fifty dollars upwards right um, across the range. So and I think that's well worth, you know worth the safety, worth the peace of mind. Absolutely. Isn't it? Yep. Three hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good on you. Ford, well done. Uh, we saw this with the warranties as well. For years and years and years and years, people were holding out on three-year unlimited kilometre warranties, and Kia came along with their seven-year, yep. and and then other companies moved to five years, and that's just pushed everybody up. There is still some lagging behind, and hopefully with AEB, um, you know, as I said, Australia to sign that draft resolution. Well, I mean, thank you to the UN. I know that various <laughs> delegates and uh, and diplomats that yeah. uh, attend UN meetings in in New York are listeners. They're regularly they listening are. to the podcast, they are. and. 
they do take their guidance on in some ways. Uh, you know, we don't want to puff our chest up too much, but I know they do listen to us, so maybe we've had a tiny influence, and, and that's a good thing. I like to think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Now, um, Georgia, we're going to move on to your good self, and you authored a story uh, during the week that pricked up ears and raised a few eyebrows. Fill us in. What were you investigating? Yeah, so I stumbled across a little thing that was in 1941, Henry Ford of Ford Motor Company uh, made a car from cannabis. What? Mm. From cannabis hemp. So He didn't make a car after he'd become <laughs> involved with cannabis. The no. car actually incorporated some cannabis. made of yep. hemp. Yep. So there's there's kind of a lot of rumours on the internet about how much of it was hemp and, you know, how did he actually do it? And so it's this hemp product that does does not have um, THC, which is what gets you high. So it, it's yep. not... Tetrahydrochloride, I think, is THC. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It just sprang to mind quite quickly. Yeah, so if, you, if you smoke the car, you will not get high. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you smoke the exhaust, you will not get high. <laughs> no, I went to a high school where there was a lot of that going on. And, you know, personal <laughs> development classes, they made sure you knew what you're dealing with. Yeah, you've got to know. Yeah. yeah. But so the thing about it was that this car was allegedly 10 times more dent resistant than steel. Wow. Yep. And he was making it because there was a shortage of steel because of the war. Mm. Yep. And so all the steel was going to the war effort. And he was like, well, we've got to make cars out of something else. So he, you know, looked to agriculture. And so he was making that car out of hemp and then soybeans, corn, sisal, flax, lots of just natural yes. fibers. Yeah, just yeah. a natural fiber car. Yep. And then the amazing thing is that in around t- about 2016... A guy named Bruce Deitzen? Detson? Okay. Um, Just call him Bruce. Bruce. Yeah, Bruce. Bruce <laughs> also made a hemp car. And so this is obviously well documented because it happened in 2016 and he's been showcasing it ever since. Uh, I see. And so what he did was, because it's illegal to grow hemp in, I think it's Florida is where he, he is. resides. He is. All right. Um, and so he had to import hemp already in its like woven kind of fabric form, mm. import it in, and he made the whole body of this like little, very cute red sports car on a, um, it was a Mazda MX-5 chassis. Cool. And he's made this really cute little red sports car that looks amazing. It looks like fiberglass. It's yeah. lighter than fiberglass. It is also stronger than steel. Wow. And he's like, this is this is the revolution. Well, imagine, imagine that's how you'd treat it. I mean, when you do lay down fiberglass, it's essentially uh, mm. a sheet of plastic cloth. Yeah. So all you do is substitute um, your hemp mm. fabric and use some kind of plastic hardener or whatever I'd imagine to set it in place. Yeah. So it's yeah. lighter, stronger, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Watching the videos, I was like, this looks like paper mache. Yeah. You're making a pap- paper mache car out mm. of out of cannabis. That's essentially a late series Trabant. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, the Trabant was made out of pressed board and that's why they, they had a gravity feed fuel system as well. So if they tipped a little bit too far, a fire would start and the car didn't last very long at all. Yeah. But, uh, so paper mache may be a bridge too far, yeah. but uh, hemp feels... Feels and, okay. And the thing about it as well is that it's designed to be able to run on biofuel. So right. So can run on hemp. Yep. And the thing about it is that he was saying that depending on what fuel you put in the car, because it's a combustible engine, and the the fuel, the biobutanol. Biobutanol. Right. Yes. Yep. So it's designed for a combustible engine. So you still have an exhaust and you still get that vroom vroom sound. Right. Of like a combustible engine. And they can be, if you're using the biofuel, up to three times greener than an electric car. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay, because... because the, the process of making it yeah. is carbon neutral and then running it, he said that the goal is to make his prototype carbon negative. Wow. He's feeding back yeah, into the environment. Yeah, because it's made of and, hemp. Yeah. It's like the actual body of the car is somehow absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere Unreal. as well Unreal. as being like just not using oil. Because but that's it, isn't it? Just when incredible. You, it depends on how far you broaden the scope of... of what you're dealing with in in terms of zero emissions tailpipe emission mm. cars yeah. the making of the car yeah, yeah. okay yeah. Yeah. there's the making of the steel there's mm. the plastics in the car and mm. i know that for one tesla has gone down that road and looked at alternate materials yeah. but to have the whole thing made out of a renewable resource without using too much by way of energy or whatever to be carbon negative that's that's yeah. extraordinary and, and in terms of its is disposal, is it biodegradable? Just, is it because it yeah, wouldn't you, just sit in the ground you forever? You chop it up in a small bowl. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, and then get some friends over. And then, yeah, yeah. And then get rid of it. I'm not actually sure. I'll have to look into that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because I'd imagine it's probably, depending on how they actually form the stuff up, mm. a um, an easier proposition than than yeah, a conventional plastic or yeah, um, for or sure. whatever. Um, it's interesting you mentioned Henry, Henry Ford because, you know, prior to getting into the whole car thing um, and transport thing, he was a farmer. Yeah, and okay. and so when uh, World War Two rolled round, it gave him an opportunity to really get his hands dirty again, quite literally. And as he got older and withdrew from the the, the business, as it were, he had a museum, uh, so called. But it was really his little farm where he could go and do farm things. So yeah, right. it was like we we spoke before about yeah. Fordlandia. I think Mr. Mm. Pritchard um, wrote a story about Fordlandia where he in South America wanted to recreate, you know, American life. He had this really white picket fence, yeah. tractor in the back paddock yeah. kind of view of America. Yeah. Yeah. And I think making a car out of some kind of grain or oh, whatever it is would, would have been a, Nirvana for him. That would have appealed yeah, to him. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, there, was a, there was a black car um, in the photographs that we saw and then a white car. So there may have been more than one in period with Henry Ford. Yeah. And there's an iconic mm. shot. Of him, um, you know, taking a massive swing at the boot of this car with an axe, yeah, yep. um, and it put me in mind of uh, Peter Williamson at Bathurst in 1978 because <laughs> he came in and they couldn't open the boot on his Celica yeah. to refuel it, and one of the crew took to the back of the car with an axe, and it was yeah. very, okay. yeah. it must have been inspired by Henry Ford uh, yeah, as an actor to just get straight into it. Well, there were a yeah. lot of rumours that 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 axe was that Henry Ford used was like blunted or had a plastic cover over oh, it. Really, really, but then, but then. Bruce's car, like Jay Leno smashed it and Bruce was smashed. Like in this video I was watching, yes. like people are banging their fists on the car and it just bounces like plastic. And it's some, so of the, light. some of the commentary I saw, because of that very strength, from a contemporary safety point yeah. of view, that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. In that you're making the car very rigid around the outside. So when it hits something, the occupants of the car accelerate really quickly yeah. Yeah. rather yeah. than you having any kind of crumple zone or whatever. Yeah. So the strength is good for parking um, mm. type dents, but yeah. maybe not so good when you have the big one, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no deforming or, yeah, crumple zones. Not much there. No. It's, it's very, very strong, but yep. such an interesting mm. story. Yeah. And it would be great to get listeners' thoughts on that as an idea, whether they're across um, – it's Brian – Brian's Bruce. car, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce yep. Bruce's uh, more modern car, mm. and Henry's older ones. If they've got more information, feed it into us. It'd be great to see uh, what people make of that. Absolutely. Now we're going to move. Um, speaking of cars, that's kind of what we talk about here, I suppose. So we're going to move into the garage. Yes. And Richard, we're going to kick it off with you. This is um, what we've been steering this week, and it's a rare, a rare entry into the Very garage. Rare. Fill us in, please, Richard. I've had the uh, motoring pleasure of driving uh, Bentley's Bentayga V8. Uh, it is Bentley's first SUV or first attempt into the uh, SUV market. Uh, look, 2015 was when the first Bentayga was introduced. It was a W12. Uh, in 2018, this one came out. It's the V8 version. So they still sell the they W12? They still sell the W12. You right can still buy a W12. It's quite a bit more pricier than this one, but this one is also very expensive. Total on-road price... $454,918. Okay. Now, it lists for about three hundred and thirty-four, but there's about a hundred grand worth, worth of, of extras, extras. Yeah, on the one right. that you were steering? On the one that I was steering. Okay. Do you want me to go through just a couple of the Because straight standouts? up, $100,000 buys you an extremely nice car. That's you know, right. if you're just spending $100,000 <laughs> on the extras. Well, $100,000 buys you a Volkswagen Touareg. Which sits Great. on the same, same plat- platform. Same platform. So the same platform that's under the Bentley Bentayga, it's called the MLB Evo platform. It also underpins the Volkswagen Touareg. It underpins the Porsche Cayenne, the Audi Q7, the Lamborghini Urus, which I drove recently. Yeah. So they are kind of the same car, or the same skeleton and the same muscles wearing different clothes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's been really interesting having to got out of the Urus and into, but, but into not, this. But not all different clothes. Not all different clothes. Yeah, that's right, as we discovered. Uh, and, I, and I'll get, we'll to, get, to, I'll get to that. I'll get to that too. So just just a bit of a rundown of the, the options on this on this Bentley Bentayga V8. Uh, the first of all, the wheels. The wheels are expensive, but these ones are twenty-two inch wheels, and they are nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars a corner. 
Each corner. No, each for, wheel. The lot, for the, oh, for the, for the for all the wheels. Which is all a right. bargain, yep. right? Uh, what doesn't seem to be a bargain is the fixed side steps. So they're not the they're the running boards which run down the side of the car. Not the ones that fold out. They're just they're fixed, as it says. Nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Because I reckon you could go down to Bob Jane T Mart's <laughs> yeah. and get a set of wheels for a little less yeah. than your nearly ten thousand dollars. Yes. And those running boards. Yeah. To me. Yeah. I'll knock you up a set <laughs> for eight and a half. Just go to Bunnings. No, yeah. Jesus. All I need. Probably out of, you know, soybean I, or some kind of yeah. hemp. I could lay that into a mould and do it for, for less than that. I couldn't just believe plywood. it. It's extraordinary. I actually $10, emailed the guy at Bentley and just said, look, I'm just double-checking this price. Uh, it's identical to the one above it. It's $9,999. I think there might be a typo. And he goes, nope, nope, the sidesteps are $9,999. <laughs> okay. Is there a problem? I, oh, not at all. <laughs> um, the paint. The paint yeah, is the right. most expensive option. Uh well, actually, there's one more expensive, more expensive than the paint, but the paint, Artica White. Yep, it's from the Mulama Paint Range, which is the bespoke sort of division. Fourteen thousand five hundred thirty-six dollars for that. Wow. For white. For white. See, there again, I could pick up a couple of rattle cans and get <laughs> get your car in a. I'd do a very nice finish for a lot less than that. JC, I I reckon I reckon that's possible. Uh, okay, you walk around the car, and at the back is a tow bar. Yep. Right, and at first I thought, uh, what, what are they towing for? Uh, well, horse, horse float, horse float, Obviously. horses, and yep. we did it. We did a video on it yesterday with Mum. We did the Terry test uh, just with the Ventega, and Mum just bit, picked it straight away because I'm like, why would you need that? For? Your mum's name being Terry, Terry Berry. Terry yep. Berry. Okay, and we do the Terry test. She's wild. Not even she knows what she's going to say next. But she <laughs> she did know in this case. She goes, yeah, horses, darling. I'm like. Horse? Oh, yeah, right, because I'm thinking caravans. Uh, to get that fitted, the tow bar with the electronic brake controller is $6,989. To have a tow bar fitted? That's right. Okay. And you might see uh, an image come up on your screen uh, around about now of what's printed on the tow bar cap and also the tow bar. It's actually an Audi badge. Yes. And it says Q7 on the tow bar. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And mum was horrified by that. Um, as I, and I reckon she's right. She said, yeah. look, you've spent all this money on a Bentley. And I had to explain to her that Volkswagen is the parent group and they do share bits. But she felt that at least you could put a sticker on it that said Bentley. Or that, at least that's take- right. I mean, we're very close to that mm. because we deal with it every day. A person who's going in to buy a Bentley may not be, yeah. uh, possibly are, but I wouldn't be thrilled if I shelled out all. the big dollars and saw Audi badges on bits and pieces of I'd my Bentley. I'd feel ripped off. I feel well, like it's buying yeah. a fake handbag yeah. or something. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, like... you've bought like a Chanel handbag and you look inside and it says Target yeah. or something oh. like that. Well, no yeah. offence to Audi, but I mean, maybe it's... Or Target. Or Target. Maybe it's <laughs> David Jones. <laughs> Target yeah. handbags are very, yeah. very nice. <laughs> Our oldest daughter works part time at Target. I worked at Target. You? I worked in the sound bar, <laughs> Sight and Vision. It was nice. called Sound and Vision. Um, and but by far the most expensive one, and this is the one that's driving me a little bit angry. Yeah. And that is that you have to order the touring specification if you want AEB. Ah, AEB, yeah. There you go. AEB right is not standard on the Bentley Bentayga. So for three hundred and thirty-four thousand dollars, you don't get, get standard AEB. AEB, which comes now standard on a Ford Ranger, Ranger. Ute. Yeah. You just okay. Just buy just a let, couple of them. Just let that sink in for a second. If you do an AB, it's sixteen thousand four hundred and two dollars, and it comes part of the Bentley Safeguard Plus package. Um, you know, you also get a head-up display, but then that comes standard on a Mazda CX-5 or CX-9. Um, yeah, sure, you get you know adaptive cruise control, but that's standard on a Volkswagen, you know, Golf GTI. Um, you get night vision, which is pretty cool. Um, but in lane keeping Sorry, assist. Sorry, night vision. Is, is that night vision in the car or just you generally? <laughs> do you have do they night give you goggles? Vision? No, they don't give you goggles, so it comes up what? on your screen Super so you can powers. see, you right. know, cars in the dark and that oh, okay. right. Look, I it's been probably the the best worst car I've driven. Um, in that in that it's it's beautiful to drive. The driving experience is serene. That engine, it's a four liter twin turbo V eight making four hundred and four kilowatts and seven odd hundred thousand newton meters. It is it's a it is a battleship. Seven odd hundred thousand. So it's, I'll tell you that exactly. is a lot of torque. <laughs> it's seven hundred newton meters. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> It's a lot of it's a lot of talk. It's been a pleasure to drive. The air suspension has has been super smooth. It handles like it shouldn't. It's so good at handling. But in terms of value for money, 
it's you, there are almost no standard features. But Richard, um, we've had this conversation. Yes, we have. I think uh, my theory mm. is that an inverse logic starts to operate yeah. once you crest a certain threshold yes, on you're price. Right. You're right. So if you're up there in the stratosphere buying an obscenely expensive car, yep. those option prices are pretty much a plus. Uh-huh. So that when you're around the dinner table yeah. and you're explaining to your polo playing friends or you know others from the equestrian club yeah. that you have just bought a new uh, Bentley Bentayga, and by the way. Huh. You know how much that paint cost? Ah, fourteen thousand dollars. That's a big kind of yeah, rub yeah, your hand yeah. on the chest kind of moment. So, the bigger the number, yeah. in a way, the better because if it's kind of irrelevant, yeah. you, you're that filthy rich that you're shelling out for one of these yeah. cars. Expensive options are a bit of a plus. I, I guess so. Fortunately, I don't get to any. I don't get invited to any of those dinner parties. No, me neither. But look, my yes, mom... no, we don't invite you. We don't. <laughs> we don't well, invite people like you. I wouldn't come anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, look, my mum's got an I, Hyundai i30 uh, SR Premium, right? It's the top of the range, you know, i30 apart from the, the end models. And it came with more equipment standard than that Bentley Bentayga V8. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I understand that price is no, you know, makes you know makes no difference to, to the buyer. But I still believe that, yeah, it's, uh, it's disappointing. It's interesting, isn't it? Also, right. boot size. Um, oh, Yeah. You would expect it to have a giant boot, um, but 484 litres in a Bentley, uh, and the same thing as a Touareg, which has got a massive boot, and and the Urus. The Urus had 616 litre boot. Well, I wonder where the space has gone. It's down to the cargo cover. So the cargo right. cover, um, I believe, is, uh, is is the culprit. It's a really thick, like almost wooden one wow. in the Bentley, All and right. it folds so that um, you can you can allow more cargo space. You can increase that. To, to more, uh, but still, it's it's kind of a fixed thing. If you um, want the load retained under some kind of cover from that's a right. safety point of view, that's it. That's the volume that yes, you're dealing with. That's the yeah. volume dealing. With. And the Range Rover's got a larger larger volume, and Touareg, the same car, has got a really really large volume as well. Well, we're mm. gonna we're gonna be able to see your good self and Terry Berry yes. uh, assess this vehicle yep. in the near future. So yep. people should keep an eye out for that at carsguide.com.au. Definitely. And we're going to move to a slightly different part mm. of the car market with uh, Georgia, <laughs> the vehicle you've been driving. Uh, it's it's a much loved pre-owned vehicle. Yes. Um, fill us in on what you've been driving during the week. So I have been driving my dad's Hyundai i30. Yeah. Um. And I actually really love it. Now, it's a 2012 vintage? It is. It's definitely not new. Okay. Yep. <laughs> it's definitely, you know, the, the radio doesn't quite work. It's stuck on FM at the moment, which I am incredibly happy about. Dad's not too keen on it. Really? Mm. What's um, his preferred um, kind of type of AM channel? Is he into the shock jock talk back no, or does he, he just prefer likes classics? 702. Oh, 702 does. Okay. So the ABC. He's yeah, into the ABC. the ABC. Very good. That I-30 is fantastic. It is. I, I started my, my motoring journalism career in around about 2011, and that year, or 2011 and 12, that I-30 was getting car of the year from everybody. It was one of the very first small hatchbacks to have a five-star ANCAP rating. There you go. Like, it was outstanding for the time and still is. I Including think... your father. He would have given it a five-star rating <laughs> as well. He would have. He would have. I think it's, it's great. Like, I, every time, because I often borrow, it mm. um, and every time I do and I have passengers who have to sit in the back or we have to go to Ikea or Bunnings and load it up everyone is shocked at what I can fit in mm. it really I have yes. put a Pax wardrobe from Ikea yep. that was I think 2.1 meters got that in wow. through the boot through the front seat with a very squish side passenger yep. Yep. but with a with a front passenger all right so that was the person you didn't like <laughs> as much as yes. the others got yep. that spot all right and and it's just I go camping with it, and it yep. fits everything. Sorry, the IKEA furniture or or the, you, yes, the car. Yes, I lo- yes, I Fantastic. always take my IKEA furniture camping, <laughs> it's glamping to the extreme. Yeah, World War One officer style. You know, they had their dresser and they had different things that would come along with them. But you just take the car. Yeah, but Fine. at the moment, my brother is borrowing it, and he is a tradie. He is a plumber. Yep, and all of his tools are in it at oh, the moment, yeah. and it is. So heavy. What does your dad make of that? Is he okay with that? He's fine with it. He's my brother's just got back from a very uh, long overseas trip, so doesn't right. have a car yet. Right. So sold his Ute to to go fund away. The trip. Yep. Not fund it, but partially fund it. Right. And now has got some odd jobs. And so he's so leaning he's, on dad. So he's borrowing the car, <laughs> and all of his tools are just living in it. 
and I drove the car last night and it was so so heavy and I oh. and it, and it just clicked for me breaking. it clicked for me because I always hear in the office everyone talking about how Utes aren't a very good ride unless they are loaded up with a lot mm. of weight and I was thinking but you know they are often family cars and they are now I understand what that weight is yeah. that must yeah. make the ride of a Ute feel yes. so much better yeah yeah yeah, nothing like the tools um, to you know weigh a vehicle down. Yeah, so I ha- felt like my tires were going to burst. I really feel for your father. I think I think um, you know, <laughs> th- there's nothing you know all of these things rattling around, moving in the back. I can just yeah. see scratches and dents and carpet being worn out. The whole thing. It's, what it's what type of tools? What type of trade is he? Yeah, yeah. He's a plumber. A okay. plumber. So yesterday, so I had he's a... got the electric eel in there. He's got the something oh, yeah. stank like petrol. He warned me. He was like, oh, "It's so... going to smell like petrol. <laughs> Don't worry. It's it's my some kind of." Sort Fortunately, you're not a smoker. <coughs> Fortunate, very fortunately. Wow. Yeah. Why, why did you work out what the stink was? He, oh, he told me what it was, but it was just a tool I'd never heard of before. It was just, just petrol. It was just it was a petrol. Like I, think, I think it was a petrol operated like tool. Oh, like, right. like Pl- a, plumbers are exposed to so many different aromas. I think they just become immune to. Yeah, any I think kind he's like smell. petrol. Great. Yeah, that's, that's a lot that's better a than the smell. alternative. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just glad that the car smelled like petrol after a day of plumbing Precisely. and not something else. Wow. Oh, that's good. Wow. So uh, anyway, it's proved pretty reliable while you've been driving. It. Very. No dramas. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Now I have actually also been in a Hyundai but I, and an i30. Um, it's a newer one. It's the i30N Fastback. So N is Hyundai's Go Fast mm. badge. And it's a four-cylinder, two-litre, 202 kilowatts, which is, you know, not, yeah. not too shabby, 353 Absolutely. newton metres. So it gets mm. along pretty mm. well. But the thing I'm, I'm finding a little bit of a difficulty with is $42,000 price tag. Yeah. Before any on-road costs, so yeah. by the time you put it on the road, it's going to be well into the mid yeah. forty thousand dollar bracket. And yes, it's a nice car, naught to one hundred, six point one. So it, it, it's fast. Yeah. I'd, I'd say it's quick, rather yeah. than being blindingly fast. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Drove it for best part of the week and wasn't really bonding with it. Um, it was in the colour they call performance blue, which yeah. is like a soft pastel blue. Yeah. I really like it. I do too. Um, Polarizes opinion. Other mm. people were hesitant to get into the car yep. because they didn't like the colour. So, <laughs> so it's one of those was ones. That you? We, did you? Yes, not? I refused. Did you really? Oh no, <laughs> no, no. Uh, that was my significant other. She was worried about you know really? the, the colour. Yeah. What? So well, it's just like one of those the colour coming off. Yes, that as well. <laughs> yeah, that it might actually come off. No, that she just <laughs> didn't fancy the colour. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. That, it's a great reminder yeah. as yeah. to how subjective these yeah, things true. are. Yeah, true. Yeah. You know, you can criticise a car for the way it looks, the colour it is. Everybody takes these things a different That's way. That's so true. Hey, Very talking true. of looks, yeah, I didn't like it when I first saw it. Righto. I really like it now. Okay. Um, because I've just been every single night, I, I, I go down to the car park, our, our, the secret headquarters here on our Cars Guide Island, and I walk past it and I see it and I I didn't like it at first, but and I took it home one night and I was having a good look at it in the driveway and actually... I really like you, you it. Like it. Okay. Just needed better lighting. Yeah, it's true. It, from the back, because it it is a fast back shape, and you know, it's, yeah, it, it has polarized opinion. I think it looks really good from so do I. Behind. So do mm. I. And our fearless leader Mal is not a fan, oh. and various others in the office aren't. So once again, yeah, there it is. Yeah, the car looks a certain way, and it just yeah, different people. What do you think, listeners, viewers? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let us know. Yeah, because yeah. we'll have imagery, imagery swimming you can behind see it us. Behind for us. There it is. Eyes. There it is. There, uh, viewers. Uh, so, I just tried hmm. to combine buyers with viewers and got what, viewers. buyers. Yeah. Buyers. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> Some um, people are buyers, buyers towards <laughs> the car. Buyers, but speaking yeah. of confusion, oh dear. it's time for Musk Watch. Buyers. Hmm. Anyway. Some um, people are buyers, buyers towards <laughs> the car. Buyers, but speaking yeah. of confusion, oh dear. it's time for Musk Watch. So, Elon Musk. Yes. Twitter. Mm. Tesla. Oh, God. That little triumvirate is a recipe for confusion. And so through the week, Mm. Elon has been going out there about Tesla's refund policy. So when the decision was made to stop, you know, to shut down a few stores. Is that about having a receipt? Making sure you've got a receipt? Got to take the receipt. 28 days later. Don't put it on. Don't wear it like underpants. Yeah. And on your phone phone might not be good enough. You know, you've got to have the actual receipt. Anyway... He went out there with a message because with the move to complete online sales, 
you may not have had the opportunity to actually test drive a car before you've bought it. Yeah. Right? So they had to modify their um, returns policy. Right. And he, he said um, they'd updated their returns policy on the 28th. Um, and the tweet he sent out said, after, you can, Tesla can be returned after seven days for a full refund, regardless of whether the, dr- the person buying has had a test ride or demo from the company. All right? Okay. So seven days. Yeah. That's to compensate. And it used to be a day. Oh, that's right? a lot so, so when you could go for a, a test drive, it used to be a day. Yeah. So people got very confused, and Elon just kind of stirred the pot and made it even more confusing. So a new return policy was posted to Tesla's website on Wednesday evening this week because, as Tesla US told The Verge, there had been a delay in the language being updated on the website. So they still had a day on the website. Oh, right. Elon's out there saying, you got seven, seven days. Seven. Yep. And in fact, he sent one saying, you know, you can return it after seven days. This was the second tweet. Yep. And people thought that was ambiguous. Does that mean, okay, once seven days has passed, I can still return oh, the car? Right. Oh, after seven Correct. days. Correct. So, so you have to keep it for seven days. You cannot return so it within then he, that rhyme. Elon's gone out with a tweet a little while later mm. saying, oh, just to straighten things out, yep. you know, if you did go one day over, kind of eight days, we'd probably live with that to try yeah. and clarify the statement. Yeah. So again, there's stuff that's just going out this there is, that is confusing. As, as much as I, you know, aren't, you know, too fond of lawyers. This is what they're for. Mm. They they write statements which are kind of bulletproof. They yes. would never let that go through. And Elon's yeah. obviously been sitting on the couch and he's just tweeted that. Yeah, yeah. And like I kind of like that accessibility he has. But he's, 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 this is it, why there's also customer service <laughs> reps yes. who say this That's is right. what the policy is. I'm sorry. Would you like exactly. to speak to a manager? I'm sure he <laughs> would position himself as customer service rep number one. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. You know, for sure. It, it is. It's tricky. You're right. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot to admire about that. And yeah. when you do follow him on Twitter, you'll see he will respond yeah. to individual people yeah. who've coughed up with some kind of complaint or issue. Which is actually yeah. more than a lot of customer service reps will yeah. do. That's so <laughs> exactly. true. And so ideas. True. You know, someone said, when are you going to do a pickup? And he's like, yeah, pickup. Let's do a pickup. <laughs> and it's like, and I kind of were like, oh my God. Made and they're going to do it. But it would also money. be, yeah. hey, why don't we just border the center of the earth? Yeah, yeah. Good idea. Do you know, he'd be onto that okay. as well. <laughs> um, now, <laughs> so the other thing this week is there have been a couple of hiccups mm with the delivery of the Model 3 in its base, much promised, much oh, yeah. anticipated $35,000 US yep. Uh, yep. price. So um, the drives Edward Niedermeyer has been investigating this and says that customers are reporting Tesla is, quote, delaying scheduled delivery dates and trying to upsell them to more expensive versions. So oh. they've gone out there to explore the, the kind of Teslaverse mm-hmm. on the official Tesla.com forum Tesla Motors Club, Model 3 Owners Club, Reddit's Tesla Motors Forum, all of these places, and this is very much what they're picking up. Right. So Tesla has allegedly been texting customers to delay previously scheduled deliveries. Um, And a customer on Reddit said, I just got a call from someone at Tesla asking me to pay more for the longer range Model 3. So oh it just seems to be, again, Iffy. a yeah. bit of a ready fire aim. You know, yeah. We've got this $35,000 Model 3 uh-huh. and it's all set to go except on the basis yeah. of this, it might not be. Yeah. Not quite I mean, so ready. I'm taking that, that last comment about, you know, oh, they called me up and they tried to make more, pay more money. I can see how that probably occurred because yep. the, the buyer's gone, I would like it now. And the, and the Tesla you know, rep's gone, you can't have it now, it's not ready. And then the Tesla rep's gone, well, look, if you do want a Model 3 right now, you know, you can buy the this one. Precisely. So I don't think they're being forced. I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's a conspiracy. I just don't think they're ready. Well, customers are seeing it. But people who have their orders in and been told that they would have a car at a certain time mm. are being told that's been delayed. Yes. Or you can up, upscale, you know, walk up to the yeah. next model. Yeah. They're feeling like it's a bait and switch. Like they've been uh, brought in on the promise yeah. of this lower price and then they've been tried to switch them out yeah. to a more expensive one. That's what it feels like. Whether or not that's the yeah. intention, yeah. that's the impression that these people are getting. Yeah. And there's seemingly a little bit of form on the board. I wasn't aware of this, mm-hmm. but again, according to the drive, when the Model S arrived, there was a 40 kilowatt hour entry level model at $50,000 after you got your $7,500 tax credit. Um, and it was cut after a relative handful of deliveries. And it's kind of a chicken and egg situation yeah. because Tesla said there was no demand. But then on the other hand, people say, look, with delayed availability and it 
couldn't be supercharged. You couldn't hook it up to the supercharger. Yeah. Mm. Um, that may have been factors as well. So were you just, again, putting one out there to yeah. get people interested? So it's not a nice situation. Doesn't, no. It doesn't feel good. It feels good. like a would you like fries with that. It does. It yeah. does. You know? so, yeah. Yeah, would you like to spend $2 Wouldn't and, you like the super and buy this water bottle gulpy. as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. I, just want, I just want the regular like, ones. This is, this is just what I want. Yeah. Yeah. This is and all I, I need. This is all yeah. I wanted. And I should say that Tesla Australia Model 3 delivery date is around mid-2019. So that's for any variant of Model 3. Oh, We're not okay. necessarily talking about this um, mm. entry point car because I don't think, it, you know, seemingly it doesn't exist at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's unclear which variants, but we'll wait and see. Wow. Meanwhile, in the US, they're using those rental cars. I was with a, with a photographer uh, two days ago. He said, oh, I was in the States. I've driven the Model 3 and I've gone, what? Right. I haven't right. even touched one yet. And yet he had one as a rental. Well, the wow. Bloomberg Model 3 production tracker <laughs> is at 6103. So they've crested the 6,000 yeah. mark. That's up a couple of Excellent. hundred units on last yeah. week. So that's top stuff. Uh, but the share price is steady at around 275. So, you know, when you think back to Elon's tweet, I'll take the company private at more than $400 a share. Yeah. Uh, and we're some way yeah. away from that. Yeah. Point. But uh, as always, we'll keep an eye on that and we'll keep an eye on the Tesla base model three deliveries during the week. Yes. But I think with that, we've reached the finish line. Thank you, Georgia. And thank you, Richard. Thank you. And thanks, as always, to our producer, Mr. Pritchard, for his technical and creative brilliance. You can join the conversation by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. You can listen to and watch us on YouTube, so jump into the comments with our regulars and be heard. If you're enjoying Tools in the Shed, please let other people know and please rate and review us on iTunes. It helps people find the podcast. Till next week. Funny you should be talking about rental cars, Richard. I was at the airport earlier this week and banged my shin on a rental car. It hurts. Oh, it does. God.